Today I'm going to try something a little bit different. Instead of just talking at you about some kind of archaeological artifact, I'm actually going to make one. Hey, my name is Nathaniel Foss and I'm an archaeologist. I have been for over a decade and this channel is dedicated to the archaeology of North America, in particular the region that we call the Eastern Woodlands, prior to the colonization by Europeans. Now, these are drawings of some bone pins that have been recovered from sites north of the Ohio and the Mississippi River. And I'm going to be making my own based on these Middle Archaic specimens M1 and DD6. And while I'm doing that, I'll talk about some of the research that's been done surrounding these artifacts. First, I'm going to need to make some tools. I'm using a moose antler billet here to knock a flake of mahogany obsidian. This is going to be used to scour a guideline in the bone blank that I'm using. This is the metatarsal of a white-tailed deer that I found at work. It's part of the back foot. These are great for making bone pins because they're very straight and have a very thick cortical wall. This groove running down the front is also going to do quite a bit of my work for me. Scouring the side is going to take a while to get set up. All I'm really doing here is getting a small groove started that will help to guide a more heavy duty tool later on in the process. So now I have this guideline that's running down the side of the shaft of this metatarsal. Now I'm going to transition to using this piece of reed spring chert. It's basically just a big flake that's split in half. At this point I just need to deepen and widen the groove that I got started with that guideline. Now is probably a good time to get into some of the research on these artifacts. Bone pins are regularly found all over the eastern woodlands. Needles too. But there's a particular stylistic tradition that is unique to the area north of the Ohio and the Missouri rivers. This 1997 paper by Richard Jeffries is the foundational piece and it covers a lot of ground. I'll get into those details a bit later. We have some hints about the function of these pens because when they've been found in burials, they're either found next to the head being used as a hairpin or at the hip, which probably means they were used to fasten fabric, either clothing or some kind of a burial shroud. However, these artifacts are not normally found in burial contexts, so they appear to be fairly prosaic items of personal adornment, not specifically ceremonial pieces. All right, that groove's pretty well established now, so I can kind of pick up the pace and go a little faster. So you can see here how the part of this flake that I'm using right now is sort of V-shaped. It's mostly widening the groove, which will make it easier for another part to get in there and deepen the groove later. These kinds of slightly modified chert flakes are really the powerhouse of the stone toolkit. I found a lot of times that working with bone or other hard materials, as the tool gets dull, it'll break on its own that just kind of resharpens it. It's kind of a self-maintaining tool. Mm -hmm. 
bring her. Check it out, I got through the cortex. Now I've just got to extend that down. It'll go a lot easier from here on. Now I'm working much more on getting either end cut down than I am working on the middle. It should all come out at about the same time. All right, so you get the basic idea. I basically just scour through the cortical wall of the bone on either side until eventually I'm able to crack the thing out. All right, so here is our preform. There's a few different ways that I could go about working this down into the final product. I could use like a sandstone to grind it, but I think I'm gonna stick to using uh, my flake tools. I'm pretty happy with those. So this left end I'm gonna use as the base end, and then this end over here on the right, I'm gonna make the point. All right, I've only done a few minutes of shaping with this same flake tool, um, but you're already starting to see the, the rounding start to happen, and I've got more of a thickened in on one end, and we're looking at the pointed end right here. This is going to be the, I don't really know what to call it, the base, I guess, the, the flared part. And I'm really just using this uh, broken flake again, just the really right angled portions to scrape at it. And you can see the bone dust coming off onto the table. Now, normally, I would do this outside, but it is a hundred and fuck degrees out there, and I'm not going back out there unless someone's paying me. This bone desk can come up with a vacuum cleaner later. So this is probably a good time to get back to the Richard Jeffries paper. In that paper, he identified seven styles of bone pens. These are the crutch top, which is the most common. It's got this transverse base that sort of resembles a nail head to me, but they were seeing it as crutches. It's also got T-top pens, which are similar, but they expand more smoothly and are usually engraved with these linear patterns. Double expanded pens have a base that narrows at the middle and about half of these have a hole drilled in that base. This can be more or less asymmetrical. There's a couple of different kinds within that style. There's a cruciform style and a fishtail cruciform, and also a spade top type that kind of looks like a bullet to me. And finally, an expanded side type, which is also called a square top type, which often features a decorated shaft and an undecorated base. So the one that I'm going to end up making is going to be kind of a hybrid of that square top type and the, uh, the double expanded with some decoration inspired from the T-tops. A guy named Andy White has published this here figure showing the chronology of these types. Take note that these dates aren't calibrated, so they're actually a few hundred years older than he's saying they are here. Now, Jeffrey's main point with this paper is that these decorated items appear in the Middle Archaic period at a time when people were establishing longer-term intensive base camps during the Hypsothermal period. I've talked about the Hypsothermal before, but it was generally a warmer and more arid period than the early Holocene. If you check down to the description, I'll have links for those videos. Now, despite the fact that people were forming more permanent communities when these bone pens were made, the styles and decorations don't form discrete localized patterns in this main study region. 
So any of the seven point types you find, you'll find them on the Ohio side, you'll find them on the Missouri side. They don't really coalesce into, you know, an Eastern form and a Western style and a Southern style or anything like that. You find them all across the entire region. And there are two reasonable explanations for this. Either people across the entire region were maintaining exchange networks where they were seeing each other's pens and copying each other's material culture, or different regions did produce local styles of bone pens, but they were being exchanged or gifted across the region. So it's either a copying pattern or a distribution pattern. But either way, this is evidence that social networks between communities are being maintained. However, these networks don't appear to have crossed south of these two rivers, as none of the seven pen styles have been recovered in Kentucky or below the Missouri River. Now, the fact that the decorated bone pen tradition freely crossed the Mississippi River shows that this was the result of a cultural boundary, not a natural one. It was just as easy for them to have crossed the Ohio or the Missouri down south as it was for them to cross east-west across the Mississippi. Now this raises some important theoretical issues. Why is it that during the late Middle Archaic period, this artifact type was so common between the Missouri and the Ohio rivers, but absent elsewhere? In the early 20th century, this would have likely been interpreted as a material signal of a coherent ethnic identity, but as we know from the common examples of blue jeans and cast iron skillets, material culture often has nothing to do with ancestry or language or ethnicity. These kinds of material correlates can go across those kinds of lines. What about social status? So that's possible, but why does it not extend beyond the boundaries of these easily navigable river systems? Were people in Kentucky conscious of these hairpins and were deliberately rejecting them, or were they just oblivious to their significance or existence? I think the pattern that we're seeing here is best explained by the strength of social networks north of the rivers. That these people were actively maintaining social ties to each other, and because those sustained and reinforced relationships caused certain material items to become popular. Whether those people saw the pens as important signifiers of those relationships or not. Identity is a really hard thing to get at in the archaeological record. Sometimes these material items, these decorated things, really are symbols or claims of identity. And, but we can't just make that assumption. And when we're dealing with a time period that's so many thousands of years in the past, it's really difficult to identify if these people saw these as badges of what community they're coming from or, you know, what they actually meant beyond an item to hold your hair up or pin your clothes together before buttons were invented. Man, you can really hear how much material this tool is removing on every scrape. And this is still that same piece of Reed Spring chert from Arkansas that I've been using this entire time. Alright, you can see that I've squared off the base on this thing, or the head, or however you want to think of it. And now I'm going to start doing some engraving. Really just some simple linear patterns. This thing's not wanting to focus very well, is it? Do one across the bottom. I made myself a new flake for this off camera with a little piece of reed spring that came from Missouri. It's not a surgical grade piece or anything, but the teeth are going to get most of the work done. You can see that kind of jagged edge.
I'm kind of experimenting with some of those zigzag patterns that I saw on some of those fishtails. I've never really tried that before, but we'll see how it comes out. Yeah, this phone is not wanting to focus in on, on this head, though. I'll pack the thing with like some charcoal or something and hopefully it'll show up pretty well in the final product. All right, so here we are. Final product. Uh, a couple things to notice are in the back, there's still a uh, trabecular bone visible. I wasn't able to remove all of the bone interior from here. Like I probably could make it thinner and thinner until I got rid of that, but it would really screw with the structural integrity. And I've have never actually seen the back of a legitimate archaeological specimen of one of one of these kinds of things. I've seen other like bone pins and needles and so on, but never anything like this in person. So I'm going off of uh, conjecture and what I'm actually in the mood to do. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is this is that reed spring chart flake that I made pretty much this entire piece out of with the exception of the little bit of obsidian work that I did and uh, to just start the groove. Um, but you'll see here this area was where I got most of my work done. Uh, there was also quite a bit of scraping along the side. And if we look at, at it under a microscope, we'd see a lot of uh, wear and tear along these edges where I was doing a lot of the baseline scraping. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I've got for today's vid. Um, if you've got any questions or comments, you can leave those down below. I look forward to reading them. And as always, thank you for watching.